We hold these truths to be self-evident. But all men and women are created equal and out by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, etc. Oh, it's that time again. It's time for another episode of TV's Rob is Unwoke. I am your host, TV's Rob. Welcome to it. Now, to open the show, you heard a clip of one Joseph Biden, the president of the United States, allegedly. Alleged president of the United States. And as you could tell, he doesn't he can't get his words right. He still cannot get his words right, even when reading a teleprompter. That tells you that there is something seriously wrong with that guy. But I'm not going to dwell on what he's actually saying in his speeches, because we could do that all day with all of his flubs and gaffes, including this one. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by go, you know, the you know, the thing. I guess we got to give him marks for at least improving instead of saying, you know, the thing. He actually got a little bit further into the lines and then said, et cetera. So I guess we got to give him a little bit of credit. But the thing that I want to point to as we are winding down and moving beyond this most recent Memorial Day weekend is a pair of tweets from him and Vice President Kamala Harris. May 29th, over the weekend, Joe Biden sends out a tweet with him standing in front of a little girl, which he should never do. He should never be allowed anywhere near the presence of children. Period. We all know why. Okay. BLM does not stand for Black Lives Matter. It stands for Biden likes minors. If you don't believe me, look it up. He puts out a tweet with him standing in front of a store with an ice cream cone saying, stay cool this weekend, folks. Really? Really? You've got to be fucking kidding me with that shit. Stay cool this weekend, folks. (laughs) I'm just plain old middle class Joe. I'm just your average guy. I'm enjoying ice cream on a weekend. (laughs) The unofficial start of summer. (laughs) You know the thing. (laughs) Kill me. But then his vice president, Kamala Harris. Oh, you got to love this woman. You have to love this woman. I mean, she's just so great and so wonderful. She sends out a tweet that day as well with a picture of her just smiling and looking off into the distance. I don't know what the hell she's looking at. I guess this is supposed to be like a candid photo. Oh, look, she's smiling and enjoying herself. (laughs) Again, kill me. Her tweet, four simple words, four simple little words. Enjoy the long weekend. Okay. Enjoy the long weekend. Now, let me ask, is there a reason that we should enjoy this long weekend? Is there a... You know, I think that there was something going on this weekend that, I don't know, maybe the leaders of the United States should be pointing out. I mean, am I wrong here? Maybe I'm wrong. You tell me. All right. Hit me up on Twitter at TV's Rob Official. Leave a message for the show at anchor.fm slash TV's Rob is Unwoke and express your thoughts on this. But I could have sworn that this weekend was Memorial Day. You know, the time of year, the weekend, the day that we honor the men and women who have died while serving in the U.S. military, protecting and defending our freedoms, our freedoms that we all take for granted. They paid the ultimate price and gave the ultimate sacrifice for us to have the rights and the privileges that we enjoy. They defended my right to be an asshole and our president and vice president can't even take the time in a tweet to really thank them. Instead, it's stay cool this weekend or enjoy the long weekend. That was an attitude that we had as kids. We didn't care what the reason was. We were just glad that we didn't have school. So obviously, I guess they're glad that they get to jump out of Washington, D.C. for an extra day, which, according to reports, Joe Biden has spent more time away from the White House on the weekends than any other president up to this point, including Donald Trump. 
you know, lunch pail Joe just sees the White House as a Monday through Friday type of job. Really, the presidency of the United States of America is a Monday through Friday, nine to five type job. Are you kidding me? Trump got blasted for going to Mar-a-Lago on the weekends and playing golf. And yet Joe Biden seeing the White House as a Monday through Friday, nine to five type gig is perfectly okay. The hypocrisy is killing me. But either way, back to the main point. So Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, the president and the vice president of the United States, sends out these nonsensical, stupid ass, childlike tweets. Well, Twitter did not take too kindly to that, at least some of Twitter, because we all know that there are people on Twitter that will bow down and kiss the feet of everything that they say and everything that they do on Twitter because, oh, they're just so wonderful. Well, Kamala Harris in particular took a lot of heat over the weekend for telling Americans to enjoy the long weekend, which ends with a national day of mourning. She tweeted the celebratory words Saturday afternoon, along with a picture of herself smiling. She did not mention Memorial Day, the upcoming federal holiday reserved for honoring military members who have died protecting the U.S. And of course, one person said, I've never been able to enjoy Memorial Day. It became that much harder when I lost my son fighting for this country. Thanks anyway, Madam President. That's the audience that I want to talk about the most. The families of the fallen soldiers. Can you imagine their feelings when they saw her tweet and when they saw Joe Biden's tweet completely blowing off the purpose of this weekend? And before I get too far into this, I really want to take a moment to stop down and say on behalf of myself and anybody who listens to this podcast, I'm sure that you share these sentiments with me. I want to thank every single military person who gave their life defending this country. You are true heroes. And to those families, you are heroic in my eyes. Because you bear the pain of losing somebody who so selflessly gave their life to defend the country that they love. And you don't get nearly enough credit And I want to give y'all all all the credit in the world right now. Well, Kamala Harris did an about face and she decided that, okay, maybe I should pay some tribute to vets after taking so much heat online. So on May 30th, she tweeted out saying throughout our history, our servicemen and women have risked everything to defend our freedoms and our country. As we prepare to honor them on Memorial Day, We remember their service and their sacrifice. Now, to me, that sounds like that was typed up by one of her press people, one of her spokespeople. I don't think that was actually came from her. I really don't. And Joe Biden, of course, he took a lot of heat, too. So he's been making up for it a lot. Apparently, over the weekend, he gave Army Colonel Ralph Puckett a Medal of Honor, which good. You should always take the time to honor servicemen and women. should always take the time to honor them. Then he spoke at a Memorial Day service. And then on Memorial Day, the day I'm recording this, Joe Biden tweeted out, We have a sacred obligation as a nation to always honor the memory of those we've lost and to support their families. That is the vow we make each year on Memorial Day. Another tweet has a picture of him standing in front of a wreath with his hand on his heart, looking down. His tweet read, On Memorial Day, we honor and reflect upon the courage, integrity, and selfless dedication of the members of our armed forces who have made the greatest sacrifice in service to our nation. It's amazing how they had to take a lot of heat over the weekend just to start crafting a message that seemed right. But again, these tweets from President Biden, I don't believe them as them actually being tweeted out by him because that doesn't sound in line with what he does. The stay cool this weekend, folks, makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? But while our elected leaders were ignoring the meaning of Memorial Day, there's one organization out there that I really have to give some kudos to because they really hit me in the feels over the weekend. 
And I'm going to get to that here in a moment. Now, over the Memorial Day weekend, there is one thing in particular that I personally enjoy, and that is the day of racing on Sunday. Traditionally, we have an auto racing triple header from early in the morning till late at night with the Monaco Grand Prix for Formula One, the Indianapolis 500 for IndyCar, and the Coca-Cola 600 for NASCAR. And while I often don't wake up in time for Monaco because 6 a.m. on a Sunday, (laughs) no, not doing it most times. But if I happen to be up and I happen to catch it, hey, that's great. But the things I really look forward to are the Indy 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. Now, IndyCar and NASCAR both do a great job that weekend of setting the tone and memorializing the brave men and women who gave their life in defense of this country. Between the two, I think that NASCAR does it better. And the reason I say that is NASCAR engages in what they call the 600 miles of remembrance. Now, 2020 aside, traditionally, there's a lot of military members at the track. A lot of members of the families of fallen soldiers are at the track. And each car has the name of a fallen soldier across the top of the windshield. And I find that to be the most touching thing. The tires from Goodyear usually reflect some sort of military organization in terms of a foundation that partners with the military. A lot of the drivers take the time to get to know the families of the people that they are representing on their windshield. And there was one story yesterday during the Fox broadcast that they aired that really, really hit me in the feels. It really hit me in the feels to the point where I was emotional watching it and I typically don't get emotional watching TV, but this time I did. And I want to share with you a portion of the story from the NASCAR on Fox broadcast. The number one car of Kurt Busch carries the name of Corporal Jason Dunham. This Memorial Day weekend, we remember Corporal Dunham and the impact of his courage and sacrifice. Tom Rinaldi has the story. In early 2004, Jason Dunham was a corporal and rifle squad leader in the Marines and was set to deploy to Iraq. We were on the back porch and I says, look, keep your head down and your helmet on. And I says, look out for the guys that are with you. I said, keep your head down and your helmet on. I told Jason, you promised me. You promised me that you come home to me. April 14th, 2004. Dunham's unit was on patrol near the Syrian border when a Marine convoy was ambushed. He ordered his squad toward the fighting. Dunham and I were searching vehicles together and uh, we were walking up to this white land cruiser vehicle. I looked in and I saw a whole bunch of RPGs and AKs. So when I looked up to inform Dunham, the guy in the car had grabbed onto him and tried to start fighting him. Uh, I didn't realize that he had a grenade on him. The insurgent released a grenade. Dunham shouted to his fellow Marines and then covered the grenade with his helmet and body. The explosion was like a slideshow. Um... And I remember as I was falling back, I saw Dunham's body like raise up with no helmet on. The last time I saw him was when he was basically being lifted from the impact and explosion with no Kevlar on. Eight days later, at a naval hospital in Maryland, Corporal Jason Dunham died. He was 22 years old. I'm going to include a link in the description of this episode so you can actually go check this out for yourself on YouTube. If you manage to watch this and not get emotional, you might be dead inside. That's all I'm going to say. Now, there were 38 cars in the field at the Coca-Cola 600, each of them carrying a name on top of the windshield. And imagine 38 stories like this one being remembered during NASCAR's longest race. 
Now, there has been talk and there have been rumblings and grumblings and people complaining, saying that the Coca-Cola 600, oh, that's too long of a race. It's too long. It's 400 laps. It takes over four hours to complete. It's too long. It needs to be shortened. It's one of NASCAR's crown jewel races, along with the Southern 500 and the Daytona 500. For what they do during Memorial Day weekend alone, for those very reasons, I don't think they should touch the length of the Coca-Cola 600. 600 miles of remembrance honestly isn't nearly enough, but it's a great way to memorialize the fallen heroes of this country. Okay. Whew. I know that was some heady stuff and that was some serious stuff, but I think it really had to be addressed. You know me, I try to have some fun, try to keep the mood light, hit on a couple of things that kind of pissed me off throughout the week, but man, I really had to go down that road. And I hope you understand. And I hope you agree. If you do, hit me up on Twitter at TV's Rob Official. If you disagree, hey, do the same thing. Leave a message at the show on its homepage at anchor.fm slash TV's Rob is Unwoke. I'll play those messages and we'll have reaction theater. It'll be fun. So give it a try. But moving on. But I'm going to kind of keep it related here. You know, we like to weave an intricate tapestry sometimes on this show. So we're going to move on. But we're going to stick with cars. See? Uh, huh, huh, huh. See, we talked Memorial Day. Then we morphed into Memorial Day in the context of auto racing. Ho, ho, ho. Then we have from auto racing, we're going to go to regular cars. Oh, you would almost think I'd do something like this for a living. But don't kid yourselves. I really don't. The real Ford Mustang is going electric. So a report says, I've got something to say to that. Nope. Nope. Not interested. Keep your electric cars to yourself. I don't want it. Of course, like all auto manufacturers, Ford is plotting an electric future across its lineup. And a new report says the Mustang Coupe and convertible will be following the Mustang Mach-E down the zero emissions highway. Now you may say, but TV's Rob, you are already talking about a Mustang that's electric. Yeah, the Mustang Mach-E. However, that is not a Mustang. That is a crossover four-door thing with the Mustang nameplate. What I'm talking about here is the actual Mustang, okay? The iconic two-door pony car that debuted in April of 1964. The iconic pony car that has survived all of these years through gas shortages and gas crises and emissions regulations. The very two-door pony car that I myself got this year with a 2021 Mustang GT 5.0 pumping out 460 horsepower. okay? We're talking about that car going all electric. And I wonder, hey, Jules, what do you think of an all-electric Mustang? Now, General Motors CEO Mary Barra has already said that the company will produce an all-electric fleet by 2035. Ford, in response, said a new EV platform would be the base for EV versions of the Explorer, Lincoln Aviator crossover, and future rugged SUVs, such as an electric Ford Bronco. Imagine how far OJ could have gotten in one of those back in the day. Ford has also said that it now has 70,000 reservations for its all-electric F-150 Lightning, one of the fastest production trucks alive, following the pickup's debut last week. That's up from 44,500 as of Friday morning, but far below the reservations for Tesla's upcoming Cybertruck that doesn't even look like a truck, according to CEO Elon Musk. And, and while I was surfing around this past week, I saw a rendering for this Ford Mustang E1. Now, this is just a rendering not made by Ford. It's made by some other person, Tyler Kwan. It reimagines the Mustang in a new, smaller segment and branches the name off onto its own sub-brand, akin to, like, Ram, okay? But we don't need it. We don't need it, Okay. Now, this rendering from designer Tyler Kwan, I don't like it. 
at all. It doesn't even look like a Mustang. It draws some inspiration from the Mini Mustang or the Mustang 2 that they tried back in the day, but I'm not a huge fan of this. In fact, it doesn't even look like a Mustang. In the rear end, it does have the iconic three signal lights, but it looks more like a Corvette Camaro with a little bit of Mustang styling and it looks smaller and the lights are smaller and it just looks dumb. And if electric vehicles are going to become the thing, if they all look like this, nobody's going to want to buy them. Tell me, will car enthusiasts, the car enthusiasts that listen to this program, can you tell me if you would really be interested in a electric Mustang or an electric Camaro or an electric Corvette? Would you really want those, or do you want the big, throaty V8 muscle that we're all used to? But getting back to Ford, you know, as they shift from being a car company to what they're now calling a mobility company, I don't even know what that means. Now, they say that they have no comment on future product speculation, but Ford Performance Chief Engineer Carl Widman recently told Auto Week, I don't think the gas engine has met its day in the near term. There are still a lot of fans of it. However, he said, it's ultimately up to the customers. They drive what they do. Yeah, but you're still shoving electric cars down our throat. And the prospect of an electric Ford Mustang, I'm not there. I'm not wanting it. But hey, maybe when they start releasing those and they get rid of the gas combustion Mustangs, maybe they'll make the value of mine go up significantly. Who knows? But an all-electric Ford Mustang is not the only thing that I don't want, that I'm not asking for. And I'm relatively pissed off that this is the direction that we're headed in. The future of cars scares the ever-loving shit out of me. Because I don't want to give up a gas engine. I don't want to give up having my own car. I don't want to have ride share. And I don't want to have electric cars. These self-driving cars? Uh Uh-uh. I want to be in control. Call me old-fashioned. And after seeing all of the Tesla crashes with their autopilot mode engaged, (laughs) tell me you want one of those. Tell me. No, really, I dare you. Tell me that you want one of those. But another thing that I didn't ask for this past week, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC as most of us know it as, says that companies can mandate that employees in a workplace must be vaccinated against COVID-19 and that employers may offer incentives to workers to get vaccinated as long as they're not coercive. Now, let me ask you something. How is get vaccinated or lose your job not coercive? Companies considering implementing these policies will be held accountable for anything that goes wrong with people who get vaccinated in order to work. So guess what, people? The government has now provided the scapegoat with this COVID-19 vaccination crap that they've been shoving down our throats for the past six, seven, eight, nine months. We're not able to sue the pharmaceutical company that designed the vaccine, and we sure as hell cannot sue the government for any adverse side effects that may be experienced from it. But now you can be damn sure that you can go and sue your employer if they require you to get vaccinated. So now we have our scapegoat with COVID-19 vaccinations. Now, right now, a vast majority of employers have been reluctant to require workers to be vaccinated. A survey by management side law firm Fisher Phillips earlier this year found that only 9% of the more than 700 employers surveyed said that they were considering mandating vaccines. There are companies out there right now, folks, that are requiring people to be vaccinated in order to actually take a job with that company. There are people who have lost their jobs because they refuse to get vaccinated. This is a dangerous road that we're headed down. Now, I've seen online that HIPAA applies in terms of asking if people are vaccinated. Then I've seen that HIPAA doesn't apply to ask people if they are vaccinated. But this is a dangerous, dangerous road that we are traveling down. And something has to be done. I am in the crowd that has now been referred to as vaccine hesitant. I'm not hesitant. I'm flat out refusing it at this point. I'm not anti-vax. I'm anti-this-vax. And the reasons are simple. 
This vaccine has been rushed to production. None of them are FDA approved. Now, they've all been authorized for emergency use, but that is not the same as an FDA approval. When you're online and you see what people have been experiencing because of the vaccines, it makes you pause. It makes you think, is this really something that I want to have injected in my body? If the vaccine doesn't really prevent you from getting it, doesn't really prevent spreading it, what good is it? And employers forcing employees to inject themselves with something that is not really tried and tested and proven to be effective. That's really dangerous. And I fear that my employers will start to require this. And if they do, I can't say that I'm going to retain my employment with them. Just on the basis of, I don't trust it. I mean, what was the narrative all the way through the end of the Trump presidency from the left? It was, oh, I'm not going to get this vaccine that was developed under the Trump administration. It can't be safe. It can't be effective. You know, what are they doing? I'm not going to get it. Then as soon as November rolls around and Joe Biden is declared the winner of the presidential election, all of a sudden, everybody on the left, oh, these vaccines are safe and effective. I'm going to go get mine. What really changed? I'm not a fan. And I think employers really need to wake up and they need to stop thinking this way. And they need to say, you know what? You guys have the right to decide what you want to do. Now, some employers are doing the whole, if you're vaccinated, you can come back to work and you don't have to wear the mask. But if you're not vaccinated, you have to be adherent to social distancing protocols. You have to wear the mask regardless. So employers are willing to create a two-caste system inside their own offices to use public shaming as a way to I guess, encourage people to go get vaccinated? How is that not coercive? Offering perks like a little bit of a bonus or extra vacation days if you go get vaccinated. How is that not coercive? And then what these states are doing, California, Ohio, others, we're going to pay you money to go get vaccinated? What happened to my body, my choice? Or does it only apply to that one issue? It's scary. Well, this is obviously something that nobody has thought through, but this is scary, and I'm not a fan. Lastly today, the Idiots of the Week. Authorities are investigating vandalism at a Popeye's in Missouri, where a sign appeared at the drive through window telling customers that new management would, quote, reserve the right to refuse service to white people, unquote. Lake St. Louis police reported that the sign was placed unbeknownst to the business, and that it could be related to vandalism at the same Popeyes earlier this month when several drive through menu signs were spray-painted. Of course, photos of the sign caused a furor on social media. If you're Caucasian, you may not get chicken at this restaurant, Missouri resident Kimberly Stores Collier posted on Facebook. Another user said, What is going on at your store? Please advise. This is utter BS. Another user said, Wow, is all I can say. Now, the sign actually forced the Popeyes to close for a little bit of time there. Now, the restaurant maintains that it had nothing to do with it and that it was nobody at the store that posted it. A local customer told Fox 2 TV in Missouri, I saw it all over Snapchat. I think it's kind of immature for someone to put it out there. Another customer said, it's a very sad thought that people even came up with a joke like that. I just hope we can put a more positive input on life and kind of be more together instead of pushing further apart. It's pretty sad. Now, on Thursday of last week, the restaurant's corporate office released a statement saying, quote, we have been made aware of the situation and are investigating the matter immediately. This type of behavior does not align with our brand values, and we take such allegations very seriously. The franchise is cooperating with local authorities regarding this ongoing investigation. So the police say it was a prank. The restaurant denies any involvement, and they're probably pretty sure that it was a prank, seeing as they've been the victim of vandalism here in the past. But I want to pose this question. What if it isn't, or what if it wasn't a prank, and someone at that Popeye's really meant what the sign said? Now, maybe not the manager, maybe not the general manager, maybe not the franchise owner, but what if one of the employees there 
really meant what the sign said. Is this really where we are at as a country? I'd like to think not, but the more that I see stuff like this, it really makes me wonder. But then I see videos like the one that many of you saw last week of the bikers stopping at a lemonade stand ran by a little black girl. And all the bikers bought lemonade from her. And they were all white, white bikers buying lemonade from a little black girl. So which one is the real America? I leave that to you. Leave a message at anchor.fm slash TV's Rob is Unwoke and share your thoughts. We'll play some reaction theater down the road. Well, that is going to do it for this week's edition of TV's Rob is Unwoke with me, TV's Rob. If you want to get in on the action and make your mark on the show, go to anchor.fm slash TV's Rob is Unwoke and leave a voice message. I'll play a selection of messages in future episodes in a new segment I want to call Reaction Theater. Also, if you want to come on the show and talk about something that's really pissing you off, like Tyler Morgan did and like Jeff Collins, Handicap Jeff did, didn't have somebody this week because of the holiday weekend, wanted to give everybody some peace and quiet, you could do that as well. Hit me up on Twitter at TV's Rob Official. We'll discuss whatever is on your mind and you can get it all off your chest. It's kind of like a therapy session without a licensed therapist. And much more entertaining that way. Special thanks to my wife and producer, Nikki. You can follow her on Twitter at DFW Radio Girly. And you can also follow Ryoga, the derpy cat, the executive producer, who's probably been meowing or purring throughout this entire episode. You can follow him on Twitter at Cat Ryoga, R Y O G A, Cat Ryoga, the derpy cat. And again, you can follow me on Twitter at TV's Rob Official. And we'll catch you all next week on TV's Rob is on Woke.